All right. So welcome um, to our very first episode of The New Beginnings. Um, my name is Kiana and we'll be talking about um, how to know the future, a dream that speaks, a dream from the past speaks to the present. All right, um, so for today, the I'll, I'm going to tell you a story first. So there was an absent-minded scholar that was riding a train one day, totally absorbed in his reading. So the conductor walked by and asked for his ticket. The scholar reached into all his pockets but couldn't find it. So he began checking again, rather frantically. So the conductor said very kindly, Never mind, sir, don't worry. I'm certain you have it. The scholar shot back in panic. But you don't understand. I've got to find it now. I need that ticket to know where in the world I'm supposed to be going. Millions of people around the world tonight are asking, where in the world are we headed? The future appears uncertain. They are confused. They wonder where our world is going. We don't need to wonder any longer. 2,600 years ago, an ancient king's dream outlined the history of the world. So the biblical book of Daniel, chapter 2, tells the story of the remarkable dream. The man who had the dream was at the time the ruler of Babylon, then the most powerful kingdom in the world. In only his second year as a king, Nebuchadnezzar went to bed one night. With anxious thoughts in his mind, he, like all of us, was worried about the future. He wondered just how long his kingdom would endure. Finally, he drifted off to sleep. When the king woke up from his fitful sleep, he was perplexed. He knew he had dreamed and he knew that it was a dream of great importance, but he couldn't remember what it was. The Babylonian placed great importance in such things. So Nebuchadnezzar had astrologers, magicians, enchanters, and sorcerers who claimed to be able to tell mysteries and interpret dreams. Surely, they could tell him what it was all about. Despite the early hour, they were summoned to the court. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, um, according to Daniel, Chapter 2, verse 3, this is what he said, I have, a, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. According to Daniel 2, verse 5, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made and ash heap. And continuing to Daniel chapter six, however, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Uh, continuing to Daniel chapter 2, verse 10, uh, the Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Continuing to verse 10, still, Therefore no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. Continuing to verse 11, there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with the flesh. King Nebuchadnezzar was so angry that he immediately issued a decree to execute all of the wise men. There was a time that Babylon, Hebrew young men who had been forced to immigrate there after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed their city, Jerusalem. Daniel and his three friends had been so successful in their studies that they were evidently already classed among the wise men of the kingdom. For some reason, however, the first they heard of this mysterious dream was when the officers came to take them for execution. 
Daniel asked for time to pray to his God and ask for wisdom to be able to tell the king the dream. So what responsibility rested upon Daniel's shoulders? Not only were his and his three friends' lives are at stake, but the lives of all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel returned to his house and together with his friends, they prayed for a miracle. Daniel returned to his house and yeah, they prayed for a miracle. The gods of heaven heard and honored those prayers. The Bible says that the God of Daniel that very night revealed the secret dream to him. Daniel was so overjoyed at this answer to the prayer that he said, this is uh, according to Daniel chapter 2, verse 23. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, and you have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king of commands. What an amazing answer to prayer. What an opportunity for the true God to be introduced into the pagan kingdom of Babylon. So... According to Daniel 2, chapter 24, therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, so I will tell the king the interpretation. Notice that Daniel did not take personal credit for the superhuman feat of revealing the secret dream. Uh, continuing to verse 27, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. Continuing to verse 28, but there is a God in the heavens who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Daniel knew that there was only one God who could reveal the future? In fact, the ability to write history before it happens is the evidence that the God of the Bible gives to show that he is the only true God. So according to Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 to 10, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient time things that are not yet done. The God of Daniel was able to do what all the wise men of Babylon had failed to do. God could actually tell the king what he had dreamed and the thoughts he had been thinking before he went to sleep. So going back to Daniel chapter 2, verse 29, As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you and what will Yes, the God of heaven knew that the cares and distresses on Nebuchadnezzar's mind that night. He knew the king was worried about the future and he wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know that the future was secure in his hands. Next, Daniel begins to tell the dream. According to Daniel chapter 2, verse 31, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. Continuing to verse 32 and 33, this, image, this image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Amazed, Nebuchadnezzar listens as Daniel describes the image exactly as he had seen in, it, in his dream. There was no doubt this was the dream that he had seen. Daniel continued, You watch while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. That was according to Daniel chapter 2, verse 34. And continuing to chapter uh, verse 35, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all crushed together and became like the chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was to be found. Since he worshipped such images, 
as representations of his deities, the king must have been startled by the stone that violently shattered the whole image into dust so fine that the wind carried it completely away. But there was one more of the part in this dream that Daniel had yet to relate. According to Daniel chapter 2, verse 35, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. From the beginning to the end of the whole dream, it was exactly as the king remembered it. Imagine how amazed Nebuchadnezzar must have been to be told by this noble young man every detail of the dream just the way he had seen, him, seen it himself. But what was the meaning of the dream? That's the next part of the story, the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar's dreams predicted the rise and the fall of the key nations of the earth. In just a few words, God sketched the main course of the history of Babylon's time, 600 years before Christ, to the climax of Earth's history at the end of time. This was an interpretation Nebuchadnezzar was anxious to hear. According to Daniel 2, verse 38, looking straight at the king, Daniel said, you are this head of gold. Babylon was the head, a nation represented by pure gold. A smile of satisfaction must have crossed the king's face as he heard those words. Historians confirm that gold was fitting symbol to represent the kingdom of Babylon. God was lavishly used to embellish the buildings of Babylon. So the next slide that you will see here is the example of the fabulous hanging gardens that is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Had Daniel been a clever politician trying to make a name for himself in Babylon, he would have stopped the interpretation of the dream right there while the king was happy. But Daniel had a message that God wanted to reveal to the world, a message not just for his time, but one that would be relevant to the earth's history. So Daniel humbled but boldly declared to the king, this is on Daniel chapter 2, verse 39. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. The king's smile of satisfaction must have quickly faded when he heard those words from Daniel. Babylon's proud monarch did not intend that any other nation should ever rule the world. Archaeologists discovered in the ruins of Babylon a tablet describing in this intention. The fortifications of Isagila and Babylon. I strengthened and established the name of my reign forever. Nebuchadnezzar wanted his kingdom to last forever, but God said it would not. Another kingdom would take its place. In fact, God had already prophesied exactly how the city would be taken, nearly 200 years before its fall. God even told by whom it would happen, Cyprus the Mede. His name was given in prophecy 150 years before he was even born. So according to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, God through the prophet Isaiah, he had said, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand that I have held, to subdue nations before him and lose the armors of the king, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Uh, during the reign of Belshazzar, the arrogant and proud grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus the Mede, laid siege to Babylon. Inside, Belshazzar's and his nobles were not worried. In fact, they were partying. As they drank wine from the golden vessels taken by Nebuchadnezzar's from the temple in Jerusalem, they praised the gods of Babylon. They had no idea that the prophecies of Isaiah and Daniel were in process of being fulfilled. Cyrus could not break down the walls as they were too high and too thick, so he devised another way. He would divert the river that ran through the center of the city, and his armies would go down the river until they found a way into the city. Someone, through the carelessness or treachery, had left a massive inner gates of bronze and unguarded and open. The king was killed and his government overthrown. On October 13, 539 BC, the Golden Kingdom of Babylon 
came to an inglorious end, just as the prophecies predicted. So Persia, chest and arms of silver, 539 to 331 BC. The coalition government of the Medes and Persians was certainly inferior to the glorious Babylonian Empire, but it ruled the Middle East for two centuries. Daniel predicted that the kingdom of silver would be surpassed by yet another as well. According to Daniel chapter 2, verse 39, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Did that come to pass? Yes, indeed. So the prediction that was fulfilled when the brilliant young general Alexander the Great defeated the Darius III of Persia in the Battle of Arbella in 331 BC. In the Third World Empire was Greece. Fittingly, much of the armor worn by the Greek infantry was made of brass in the third medal in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So the Greek historian Arian, writing about Alexander, said, I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to, be, to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and action. This is according to Historial Library, Book 16, Chapter 12. So Alexander died before his 33rd birthday because of a fever. After his death, his empire was weakened and split into several parts until finally, on June 22nd, 168 BC, at the Battle of Pydna, perished the empire, the empire of Alexander the Great 144 years after his death. This is according to History of Rome, Book 3, Chapter 10. So far, the prophecy has clearly been fulfilled by the succession of empires. As you remember, the dream predicted four world empires, one after another. Here is how Daniel described the final empire to King Nebuchadnezzar. According to Daniel chapter 2, verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. So now we are going to talk about Rome, the legs of iron, 168 BC to 476 AD. Indeed, iron was appropriate metal to represent the Roman Empire. Rome would rule with an iron fist or over or an even wider expanse of territory than the preceding empires and for centuries longer. Her Caesars called themselves gods and demanded the worship and obedience of all men. It was during the time of Roman rule that two events of great importance took place in this nation. It was a Roman taxation decree that took his parents to the city of David. But his birth there was the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy. Second, Jesus was crucified in Judea. Under Roman authority, a Roman governor allowed Jesus to be condemned, and Jesus was nailed to the cross by Roman soldiers. But now the pattern of the prophecy has changed. No single world empire would follow Rome. According to Daniel chapter 2, verse 41, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Continuing to verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly, of, partly strong and partly fragile. The dream here predicted that no fifth empire would, would rise and uniting the Rome's territory, but a division of what had been the Roman Empire would occur. Through luxury, political corruptions, and moral decay, Rome lost its stability and strength, becoming an easy prey for barbaric tribes that began to challenge the empire between AD 351 and AD 476. These invasions divided the empire and formed the foundations of the nations located in their Europe today. So the 10 of these divisions are listed as follows by most historians. Uh, Alemanni are now the Germans, Burgundians, the Swiss, Franks, the French, Lombards, Italians, and Saxons, English. But there are so much more to there, uh, such like 
Suevi are now the Portuguese, the Visigoths, the Spanish, the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals are considered by historians to have been wiped, wiped out or merged with other groups that no unique nations remain today. So according to Daniel chapter 2 verse 43, as you saw, iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. God's proclamation that this kingdom will never be reunited as one empire still limits what these nations can do. Europe will stay divided, even with the European market and common currency, it is still divided. Daniel said that they would even mingle themselves with the seed of men. In other words, they will intermarry royalty. In a palace in Denmark, the family tree of the royal families of Europe is pictured. Just as God predicted, they intermarried. They hoped it would prevent wars and bring unity, but it didn't work. Many of wars fought in Europe were really family squabbles. God had predicted that they would not stick together. No attempts to put the Roman Empire back together will ever last, just as iron and clay will not stick together. Think of the many attempts that have been made to reunite Europe under one government. What happened to these powerful leaders who tried to unite divided Europe? Exiled on the Isle of Elba, Napoleon, the mighty warrior of France, in the early 1800s had to admit that perhaps God Almighty was too much for them. Indeed. God was too much for all of them. So as you can see here, all of them are defeated. So God had said, they shall not cleave unto one, one to another. If only the old Roman Empire could be reunited, the Bible could be proven false. But the seven words of Daniel's interpretation have withstood the in ingenuity and determination of some history's greatest leaders. Nebuchadnezzar's stream is still standing true today. Back to our story, King Nebuchadnezzar must have been astonished by these amazing predictions. Through his dream, God has foretold the rise and the fall of great world empires. The last empire would be succeeded by a number of nations, some strong, some weak, but all hopelessly divided. According to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, And in the days of this king, the gods of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Continuing to verse 45, And as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. The next great event on the stage of human history will be the second coming of Christ, and the establishment of his kingdom, represented by the stone cut, cut out without hands. His kingdom will be founded, not by the hands of men, but by the mighty hand of God, a kingdom that will fill the whole earth. So according to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, then will be the fulfilled prophecy. The kingdoms of this world would have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. According to Daniel chapter 2, verse 47, when Daniel Finished telling the king his sensational visions and God's astounding interpretation, King Nebuchadnezzar rose from his throne and humbly prostrated himself before Daniel in honor of Daniel's great God, whose wisdom and power had been impressively demonstrated. The king answered Daniel, Truly, God is the gods of our gods, the Lord of kings and the revealers of secrets. Yes, the dream is certain. The interpretation is true. The journey is almost over. Perhaps you, like Nebuchadnezzar, sometimes worry about the future. But this dream is for you. It tells us living today that we don't need to worry about the future. 
the suffering and the stress that sin has brought into the world is all going to pass away. The God of heaven isn't going to live in the world in the hands of human rulers. He's going to come again and make everything right. You don't need to worry about the future, my friend. Nebuchadnezzar's dream tells us that we are living before the coming of Jesus. He will be the one who establishes the internal kingdom of this earth. And he wants you to be a part of that beautiful tomorrow. He wants to speak these words to you. According to Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for. But how can you know you'll be there? How can you know you'll have a place in his eternal kingdom? How can you be certain that you will be there if you will by faith do what the thief on the cross did as he hung next to Jesus? He couldn't get any closer to Jesus, but he knew that he was a sinner and that he needed to be saved from those sins that he had committed. He looked over the Savior of the world and saw the blood running down from his face, from his thorn-pieced brow. His heart was touched. He confessed his sins and cried out. According to Luke chapter 23, verse 42, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus gave him the assurance that he would be with him in that kingdom. You too can receive the same assurance that you will be with Christ and his kingdom that is soon to come. Do you want that assurance? Do you want a heart filled with hope in a place of worry and stress of this world? Do you want your life to be in hands of God who knows the controls and future? You can rest securely in his hands. And that is what I want for this afternoon. He is calling us today. He is inviting us to come today. He is appealing to our hearts right now. And um, is that your desire? You can do this with me as we pray. So let us all bow our heads for our word of prayer. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for being the God who knows the future, including ours. Thank you for providing the eternal happiness of each one of us, a future free from suffering and sin, stress, and worry. Thank you, Lord, for inviting us tonight to be part of your incredible kingdom. So tonight we want to place our lives into your hands. We want to place our worries and fears in your hands. We want to place our sin on your Savior, with the thief on the cross who asked you to save us by the grace of your kingdom. Thank you for the promise that you are coming soon as we continue to learn more about the hope-filled prophecies in the Bible foretelling the earth's final events. Prepare us for each one as we keep our hearts surrendered to you. Bless each of the family and each home represented here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.